Jordan D. Madsen is the site director for Singapore Engineering Center at Indeed.com. Jordan has worked in Silicon Valley for over 35 years. He's been with companies like Apple, Adobe Systems, Yahoo, Carousel, and is on the board of numerous startups. He's super passionate about developing software engineers and building robust software engineering organizations. And he plays an active role in the software engineering community here in Singapore. With that said, I want to ask a few questions to Jordan D. Matson. How was your experience at Startup Weekend Singapore, Seeds of Tomorrow? So I got to say the Startup Weekend's events are highlights of my year. Um, I did my first um, Startup Weekend back in 2017. I was invited. This was when I was at Carousel. And I just, I just had a blast. I ended up spending the whole weekend there um, working with a bunch of teams, coaching, mentoring, et cetera. Um, and, you know, literally every time it, it comes up, I, I do it because I love seeing what the people are thinking about, what they're doing. And if I can do some way, can help people get a little closer to that goal, <clears throat> help them to have that change, that impact and change the world. It's fantastic. It's something I just really, really, really enjoy. And I would, I love to do. Um, this was no exception. It was just a blast. We, we had some great teams here looking at solving some fantastic problems. Um, and, and I think that there's probably two out of the six that are probably going to go the distance. Um, I kind of have my bets right now in my mind. Um, and I'll look forward to it. You know, um, a couple of years ago, um, I got to work with uh, Staff Any, which was a startup, which is doing some great stuff um, in the uh, space of uh, staff management. Um, part-time uh, casual work um, uh, staffing and management of those workforces. Um, fantastic, really cool stuff, very exciting stuff. And, you know, um, I'm hoping that we'll see another one or two like that out of this year. Jordan, do you have any specific tips on since the theme of this year's Startup Weekend is sustainability, are there any specific tips you'd have for um, startups and founders who want to, sort of do something in this impact space, but at the same time, build a real business. And uh, would you have any tip on how do you connect business objectives with that theme of sustainability in, in, in a really strong way? The reason we don't have sustainability is we failed to um, internalize costs, external costs, externalities that are borne by society as a whole. Um, and sometimes that, you know, it's just because we don't yet realize it's a cost um, or we don't understand it yet. Um, but you know, the fact is pollution is an indication of wastes and inefficiencies in systems. You know, you have incomplete combustion in internal combustion engines. This is why you have pollution. You have, if you fully consumed all of the fuel and extracted all of the energy out of it, there would be no pollution. And a story I love about this is coal tar. Coal tar was a byproduct of the production of coal gas. Coal gas was used in street lamps in the, like the 1800s. And um, a byproduct of this was, as I said, coal tar. Back then, coal tar, they just were throwing it away. You get to the 1930s, 1940s, find out that coal tar is a great input to making rayon and nylon and other synthetic products. You know, but we had this huge inefficiency because we weren't extracting all the value from the production of coal gas. So it's a sign. So what that means is anytime there's inefficiencies in the system and you can squeeze those inefficiencies out, there's an opportunity to make money. You know, why do we, why do, why do we, you know, you know, now we, we get this in Singapore. Um, this is why we have the road tax. The road tax doesn't build roads. The road tax is about capturing the costs of pollution on society as a large, because you get to drive your car on the road. We have the COE and the COE is so poorly named certificate of entitlement. 
which makes people think they're entitled to do whatever they want on the road, when really what it's doing is saying, you driving a car, that congestion puts burdens on people that we're gonna make you pay. None of this goes to, neither of these pay for the roads, neither of these pay for traffic and flourishment. That all comes out of the general budget. A fact that most drivers in Singapore don't know um, and will and show that ignorance when they yell at bicyclists and say, hey, you don't pay for the roads, get off the road. It's like, yes, I do. I pay quite a bit of income tax, <laughs> um, you know, um, but there's always an opportunity, but there's inefficiencies. There's an opportunity to make things more efficient and then capture some of that. It's always about capturing value. A good business is you've created some value. Reducing costs, inefficiencies creates value. And then you get to capture some of that and build a business around it. Now, here's the thing. You can decide that you wanna capture a lot of that or you wanna capture a little of it. It's fine. Both are reasonable approaches. Really mm -hmm. what you want to do as a founder is mm -hmm. you want to identify a problem that needs to be solved, that's meaningful to solve. And meaningful can mean has significant societal implications or that you can make a lot of money at it or both. And then come up with a solution about it. And then tell me how you can, you can make that solution be paid for. Whether that's a break-even situation, you know, because you're you're choosing to be have more of a social good, or whether that's a make lots of money at it, and then you want to be able to tell a story around that. So, as a startup founder, this this is the key thing: you need to be able to master the storytelling. Now, one of the ways you tell your story is through the deck you have. And now, it was interesting several times today. I said deck and people went blank. They didn't know what I was talking about. This is a term you need to know, just deck. And guess what? There's lots of decks out there. You can find the original Airbnb deck, the original Uber deck. <clears throat> you can find them. You can look at them. You can read them, see what they, how they told their story. And then compare it to where they've ended up. Because here's one of the things. You're going to start here because you've identified a problem and you're looking at how to solve this. And there, you've convinced people that there is money to be made in solving this problem. But the solution, it's probably not gonna be what you visualized day one. Okay, it's gonna change. You know, do you know why it was called Airbnb? Because the idea was is you would, people would sleep on air mattresses in your spare bedroom or in your, in, in the, in your front room. Now, when it comes to what you're gonna do here, you have five minutes to tell that story, five minutes. So first off, make the most of the first slide you have. Your first slide is free real estate because it's the thing that's gonna be up there for five, 10, 15, maybe 30 seconds. While the, and the judges will be looking at it and the and the folks, the audience, people in the audience will be looking at it as you make the shift between speakers. So don't make the mistake of just having a pretty picture with a logo and the name of the company. Give me a tagline, something that's gonna hook me, that's gonna pull me in. That's gonna grab my attention. And you should spend a lot of time on this because this is also your tagline that when you're pitching people in conversation, you're gonna use. It's a statement of the problem that you're solving and the benefits of solving that problem. That's the first thing. Second is you've got five minutes. Other than that title slide, that means five slides, five slides. When I see a deck that has 20, 15, 20, it means that people have not learned how to tell their story. And this is a case of what Pascal, a mathematician talked about. He once in a letter to a friend, wrote them like this huge long paper, a uh, uh, letter. Let's say that it was 15 pages. And, the, and the, 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 the last part of the letter was, 
I am sorry for writing such a long letter. I didn't have enough time to write a short one. Being concise, being focused, being distilling it down takes a lot of work. Getting to five slides will take a lot of work. And it's in those slides that you tell your story. The first slide, what is the problem? Why, what, what, how are you solving it? Why is it worthwhile to solve this? Okay. A lot of times I'll see things and like the second slide is about the team. And then they proceed to read the bios of everybody on the team. I don't care about the team, team until I care about the problem. And I believe you have a solution to the problem and that it's worthwhile to bring that solution to bear. Just don't. Put it at the very end. And please don't read it to me. I can read that you went to NUS and you did National Overseas College and you went to Stanford. You know, I, I can read all that. OK, um, you know, the other thing is think about read driving down the number of words on your slides. Your slides should be very light in terms of text. They should be because the part of what's there is what you're, you're verbalizing, what you're saying, what you're communicating. Great example of this is Steve Jobs. Take a minute, take a few minutes actually, go see a couple of his product introductions. Maybe, maybe the original iPhone, the original iPad. Maybe Mac OS 10. Oh God, go all the way back to when we did the iMac. Okay. Um, <clears throat> incredible ability to, to tell a story with slides, but very few words on those slides. And when you do have words, topography matters, layout matters, you know? You know, I, I, I see some just really just some ugly shit out there and it just hurts my eyes. And it's hard to read and it's hard to bring it in and to understand it. And, you know, don't do that to me. Don't make it hard for me, okay? You know, um, and then the other thing is avoid buzzwords. I, I think everybody feels they have to say that they have AI. And I'm like, why do you need AI? We talked to a woman company today who's, who's doing some stuff around recipes. It's actually really interesting what they're doing. But it's like, oh, well, we're going to apply AI to this. And I'm like, why? Why? I wouldn't spend any money on AI here. You know? Um, you know, AI is not magic. An app is not magic. You know, ask yourself, can you build this business offline? Then what happens when you have when you bring it online? You have apps, things like that. Is that allows you to scale at lower cost? But it's not magic. An app isn't magic. AI is not magic. Okay. Um, and for the future, I would really say when you come to meet with the mentor, at least have a skeleton of a deck. At least have a skeleton of a deck. You know, um, have something that you can start having criticism about. You can have a discussion over. Jordan, do you have three tips for aspiring startup founders on how, what is, what is the first thing they should do? They have an idea, all right? What is the first thing they should do, whether it's a B2B business or a B2C business? What is it from, uh, from an investor standpoint that, that you just want to see. You mentioned that it's not important that you cover your team's resume and all that, but what is the one thing that you really is need to see? the problem you're solving? Is it a, clear a problem. problem? I want a clear problem statement. Right. right. And I want to know, I mean, really when it comes down to it, what's the problem? What's the solution you're proposing? How do you make money doing that? And I'm sorry, there's four rather than three. And why are you uniquely positioned to do that? You can drop the last one because multiple solutions could come out of a problem. And too many VCs are looking for, well, the only people working on this problem. It's like, well, if it's an interesting problem, probably a number of people are working on it. But that's, those are the things I would say. Here's the problem, here's the solution. 
Here's how you can make money about at it. And you know that I know it sounds a little bit like a broken record with some of the stuff I said earlier, but it's really that simple. Now, here's the thing. Don't get wedded to that solution you come up with. It's a solution. And I trust you that it will change. As I said, you know, Airbnb started out, why it's called Airbnb is because you were gonna sleep on an air mattress in somebody's living room. Um, that's not what Airbnb is these days. But that's, you know, it, it, it really is at some level that simple. But in terms of other advice, I could just read widely, be aware. I mean, you know, I think the observer today could tell you, I was talking with someone about airline stuff and I knew some stuff about it just because I read. Um, and it gives me enough of a, of, a, of a thing to understand a little bit of what's going on there. Read widely, you know, you know understand law, understand finance and accounting. Can you tell me what, what it means for a, an expense to be capitalized? You know, what, you know, what does it mean to amortize earnings? You know, um, you know, you know, these are, these are, these are things that are going to be important. They affect your business model, how you approach things. Um, you know, under, just read about what are the problems out there? I mean, I, I think that I, I would tell, tell the average entrepreneur, you know, read, you know, read, read the economist, read the new scientist and read MIT technology review. You know, those, those are things I would make sure that it's in kind of everybody's reading list. The, these weekends, yeah. you know, the, the one or two weekends a year that we have startup weekend are my, my favorite weekends of the year. You know, uh, I, I take, I have a lot of fun in them. 